Um, the first thing that I'd like to do today is acknowledge that we meet today on the land of the Agambi people uh, of this area. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and to leaders emerging. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to our volunteers today for their incredible assistance. Uh, because this conference is entirely voluntary run and without their excellent assistance, there will be a lot of things that uh, would not be working very well. Uh, bear with me. It was working. I think I have the touch of death with computers today. <laughs> battery in just to be absolutely alrighty so I'm going to apologize because the, the fonts here won't be won't be quite accurate uh, but <laughs> given the circumstances I think it's uh, it's what we're going to run with so today we're going to uh, do a little bit around the Scribus desktop layout presentation program. Uh, and just so that I get a feel for the audience in the room, uh, has anyone here done desktop publishing before at all? Could indication? Fantastic. What sort of programs have you used? Uh, LibreOffice. LibreOffice. Inkscape. Anyone used InDesign or Quark Express, that sort of thing? Fantastic. Um, so that gives me a really good indication of where the audience is at. But if you have any questions or uncovering things too quickly or too slowly, please let me know. Does everybody have Scribus installed? Excellent. Uh, and does everybody have the tutorial files downloaded on your machine somewhere? Excellent. You're doing better than I am. So this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to cover up setting up your document and your preferences. We're going to look a little bit at grouping, alignment and distribution because they're very, very useful layout tools. We're going to look at the different layout elements that Scribus has and we're going to be looking at how to set the properties of those elements. We're going to be looking at working with text, uh, including setting up style sheets. We'll be looking at working with colours and I'll touch a little bit on the difference between RGB and CMYK. And to finish off, if we have time, I'll cover exporting to PDF for print and web. So the first thing that I'm going to do, we've done all that, is give you a little bit of a taster of <laughs> why you should be stuck in a tutorial for me for, you know, well, <laughs> 83 minutes or so. This is why. <laughs> I don't want anybody in this room <laughs> to be producing stuff like this. So graphic design and desktop publishing tools, they're tools. But if you don't know how to use them very well, if you don't know how to drive them, you can get some very poor products out the other end. So programs like Paint and Publisher, they're a little bit like a Toyota Corolla. They're nice and easy to learn and easy to drive. Scribus is like the Lamborghini of desktop publishing tools. It takes uh, a lot longer to learn to drive. It has a very steep learning curve. Uh, it handles uh, quite trickily. Uh, and sometimes you can sort of <laughs> go around, around a bend a bit too fast. So what I'm hoping to do today is give you some skills and give you some of the hands-on pieces with Scribus so that you can do a lot better than this. Or this. <laughs> Or if you're into desktop publishing and you're also dropping acid, this. No. All right, I'll quickly change slides. All right. Yeah, sorry, fonts, bad, Kathy. So the reason that you should learn Scribus, some of your motivation for putting up with my <laughs> very poor planning today, it's a lot cheaper than InDesign or Quark Express proprietary tools. You're looking at several thousand dollars per seat for those tools. 
Uh, Scribus is zero, zip, nada, nilch. Uh, it's released under the GPL. It's available for Linux, of course, Mac, Windows. And it's almost equivalent in every way to some of those incredibly expensive proprietary tools. The other reason to stick with me through this tutorial is that I want to give you the ability to impact and to influence. Graphic design layout is a communication tool. It's a tool for impact. It's a tool for being able to convince people, uh, for being able to carry a brand, for being able to carry a message. So these are equivalent versions of the Linux Australia annual report, and I'll show the printed one around later. One of those has much more impact than the other. It's colourful, it's bright, it carries a brand message, it's inviting, it tells a story. So today I'm basically giving you some storytelling skills. So if anyone needs this for CPD type stuff, we're going to be looking at all the stuff I said before. I'm going to quickly skip through that. So, Scribus at the ready. So what we're going to do today is set up your preferences and what I'd like you to do is go to file and preferences and I'd like you to change the preferences as, as I walk through them on the screen and I'll explain what we're doing but quite quickly. Long story short, Scribus's default preferences are rubbish <laughs> and it's the first thing we need to do to make Scribus a little bit more usable. So everyone found file preferences? Yep, excellent. So, we don't have to change too many things in general. If you're working with a lot of documents, you might want to increase your recent documents so that you can grab them easily. If you have any accessibility issues or your vision impaired, you may want to increase the font size of the menus or palettes. Moving on to document. Uh, in some installations, the default page size is US letter and you don't realise until you come to PDF it and print it and realise you have to relay out your document. Two minutes now will save you many swear words later. Please set your default page size to A4. Uh, and I, I'd recommend 25 millimetre margins. Auto save is best set to five minutes when you're starting out. Uh, Scribus will auto save a document just like Microsoft Word or LibreOffice. Uh, and as you're starting out, you might want to lower that a little bit. Depending on what default is, units of points as well. Would you recommend millimetres when uh, publishing? Thank you very much for pointing that out. Um, I strongly recommend using millimetres as measurements, like here. Thank you very much for picking that up for me. Uh, points is an old print term. Um, and some people who do a lot of CSS work will know points as well. But because we're going to be doing layout for print, for, for design, we're going to use millimetres. Uh, uh, so it's that one there. No worries. That's correct. So if you set preferences, this sets it for the entire application. But if you do document setup, it just sets it up for the current document. Thank you for, for that one too. Uh, so we're going to restart Scribus in a, in a minute and, and it will pick up the new preferences. Uh, so guides. There's a reason that I want to uh, touch on this a little, a little bit. If we put guides in the foreground, by default most of you will have guides in the background. Is that what most of you are seeing currently? The reason I'd like you to put guides into the foreground is that if we put elements over the guides, you can't see the guides. <laughs> Not helpful. Um, so that's why we want guides in the foreground and it means that the guides will sit uh, in front of uh, the layout. I also like changing the colour of the guides uh, because the default guides don't, you know, they're not particularly bright, you can't see them as well. Everyone comfortable with that? Excellent. Uh, 
let's not worry about PDF export at the moment. The defaults are not terrible. Uh, one of the things that I'd like you to change in display is show text chains. By default, that's not shown, and we'll be working with text a little bit later. So I'd like us to be able to see the, the text chain. Okay. Um, for anyone who's an advanced user, you can also ex export these preferences in XML format. But Scribus doesn't currently have an import ability. <laughs> so what you have to do if you export these preferences and you want to use them on a new machine, for instance, if you stepped on one accidentally and it's gone into the bin and you have to get a new one, not looking at any machine in particular, you have to overwrite it. Uh, yep. You mentioned a moment ago changing display settings. Where are they? Uh, sure. So uh, in your preferences, you should have a display option. Sure. So the change should be show text chains. By default, that won't be set. And we want to see that because we'll be working with text a little uh, in a little while uh, and it won't show the text chain. Uh, so we won't bother exporting and importing at the moment because you've changed your preferences. So what I'm going to do now is get everybody to close Scribus, quit the application and open it up again. Sure. You know you need to do all that setup if you want it to be true to your subscriber setup. Feel free to change anything you want. That's okay. I'm doing today on hard mode. <laughs> so this will be like uber hard mode. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. Alec. Um, so I've got a question. I write traditional documentation in restructured text by the Bernie Blower. Yes. Where would scribers fit into my tool, tool set? Uh, good question. Uh, what sort of tool chain do you currently have? Um, I just export things into flat HTML files. I generate images using tools like Pandoc. Mm -hmm. Do you use LaTeX at all? No. Okay. So you can render LaTeX in Scribus. I won't be covering that today. That's out of scope. But you can't, you can't bring in HTML, unfortunately. It doesn't have Pandoc support to render Pandoc, but you can bring in GNU plot or uh, LaTeX. If you have primarily text-based documentation and it's text and images, Scribus doesn't necessarily give you additional benefit over your existing tool chain. Where it would give you benefit is where you're trying to create an incredible poster or a business card or something that has visual impact where the, the intent is perhaps a little bit different from technical documentation. But if you were, for instance, designing a manual to go out with a product, um, then this might be your, your tool of choice. Good question. Uh, has everyone quit and restarted Scribus? Yeah, excellent. Done. Done. Okay. So next we're going to move on to grouping, alignment and distribution. And first of all, I, I'd like to explain the concept. So is everyone already familiar with grouping? A couple of people? I, I will cover it. So grouping is basically where we try and treat many elements or combinations of elements as a single element. So on the picture on the left here, you can see that we have several circles. I think we've got eight or nine there. On the left, they're ungrouped. I have to click them individually to change their properties or to manipulate them. By grouping them together, as we have on the right, the program treats the elements as a single element. And that can be incredibly useful for a couple of reasons. We can lay them out on the page a little bit better. We can change all their colour at once. Uh, we can, uh, with a group in Scribus, you can change the dimensions of a group all at once. So grouping is an incredibly powerful tool to use. So 
inscribers, your group elements, basically by selecting them with the arrow tool. Uh, so in your... Uh, so everyone has an arrow tool in Scribus. So if you go back to Scribus, everyone can see where their arrow tool is. Yep, excellent. And you use shift click for multiple selections. So if you want to select all of these circles, you shift click them or you drag a box around the area of the elements that you would like to group. So we've got a little bit of an exercise to give you some practice on that. So in your tutorial files folder, you should have a folder called Exercise 2 Grouping. And if you open up Exercise 2 Grouping.sla with Scribus, I can walk you through this. So first of all, we have the easy part. Does everyone have the file open? Everyone's got this file open? Yes. Yep. Uh, anyone? Yep. I, I might move on. So a couple... Oh, sorry, sorry, Alec. I've got a prompt substitution message about you must be regular. Okay. Would you like to say okay? Yep. Uh, if you get any font substitution errors, that's totally fine. Basically, I've created this document with a particular font and that font may not be on your system. Uh, so choose whichever font you would uh, you would like. So the easiest way to group elements is to click and drag around the elements and then group them using the group icon on the properties dialog. So to bring up the properties dialog on most systems it will be using F2 and then I use the group icon to group them. Is that everyone's okay with that? No, no? Uh, sure. So under Windows uh, and Properties. Sure, thanks. Yep. And then you should have a group icon in the Properties dialog. Everyone okay so far? Yep. So I'm going to get you to group the blue circles together. I'm going to get you to group the green circles together. Ha 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 ha. The red circles are not as easy. So if I try and drag a box around the red circles, I also pick up some purple circles as well because I'm nasty and nefarious and evil. <laughs> So what we're going to have to do here, I can take this one of two ways. I can get everything except the purple circles and then I can use shift click to grab all the other orange circles like this. and then group them together. And if I move those, uh-oh, I haven't done terribly well.
I've completely failed there, apologies. Oh yeah, no power, can't get my output out. I'm going to pop those back down there where they belong. <laughs> Sorry, cheating. So if this had worked the way I'd intended it to work, <laughs> what we should have now is a group of orange objects that I can move across the page like this. So grouping is a way to manipulate layout elements on the page. It's also a good way uh, if I now ungroup these using the ungroup icon. It's also a good way to pick up certain elements and I can manipulate them all at once. So I'm picking up the small orange dots here. Yes. Yep. So we're going to get to that in a tick. I've just shift, collect, uh, shift clicked the small orange dots. And what I'm going to do now, because I have done a multiple selection and grouped them, I should now be able to change their colour. So I've just changed all those, the, the ones that I clicked into black. And by treating elements as a group, we can apply styles or colours to all of those elements at once. Now, as Marcus said, we can also do multiple levels of groups. So, for example, what I could do here, uh, I'm going to use the... the blue circles because they're a little bit simpler and I'll just ungroup that to demo. What I could do first here is group all the small circles together in one group. I can then group all the medium circles in one group together. And I can group, oops, oh, I see what's happened. As I've grouped it, it's changed the levels. and there's all a bunch hiding under there. But if I create multiple groups, what I can do with the multiple groups is then treat those uh, individually, but then bring everything back together And then group all of that together. So this has implications. For example, if I want to group multiple layers on top of each other, if I want to have smaller groups within a larger group layout, or if I want to group like things together. So grouping is uh, very, very useful. Yep. Can we do that uh, you can, and I believe the key is the shift key, so basically to dive into the group. Sorry, thank you. I don't know your name, I'm afraid. Pete. Pete, thank you, Pete. Really good question. So we use the shift key, I think it's shift, to dive into that group and to be able to select within a group. It may not be shift, apologies, but you can do it. Um, I just can't remember the key combination off the top of my head. So that's a little bit on grouping. Um, 
and again, apologies for the, the file not working exactly as expected. Any other questions before we move on? No? So layering work within the group? Uh, you mean, uh, so raising things to top and lower to, yes. But each group is on its own level. So you can't have elements within a group that are on multiple levels. So for example, if I ungroup that, and I move that to the bottom, the two on top disappear because they're covered by other things and we only see the one light blue there at the back because the entire group moves on the layer. So the entire group moves as one. So I don't think we're going to have time to go into the advanced activity for grouping, but basically what I would get you to do is to create one group for each sized circle and then group that subgroup all together as one. But I think we need to move on. So a related concept is alignment. And so alignment of elements is basically where we line them all up to make them look a lot neater on the page. And so you'll have seen this, for example, in real estate adverts, where you have grids of elements that all line up in a lovely grid, or you might have profile photos that all have to line up vertically, uh, or you'll have diagrams that uh, all need to align horizontally. And alignment is how we do that. So to do alignment, we bring up the alignment dialog, which is under your Windows menu. So does everybody have a window that looks a little bit like this, align and distribute? Sorry? From the window menu? Ah, sorry. A graphic design program that doesn't have good UI. <laughs> All right. So align and distribute uh, are both incredibly uh, useful tools as well. And what I can do with align and distribute, I'm just going to open up. my alignment file. What I can do here is align all of these elements by grouping them, or sorry, by selecting them, and then I can either align them on the left side, or I can align them on the centre vertically, and I can align them on the right hand side. So subtle differences there, but it's just changing how they align and I'll demonstrate that in a, a slightly different way. So if I go left, they all line up there. And if I go right, they... Sorry. Aha. Uh -huh. Because it's going off the first selected element, If I go right, they all align that way. I can also align them to the top. And now you can't see them. But if you're doing a horizontal layout, like this one, then aligning horizontally is very useful. So I've made those all line up neatly uh, in a row. Centre alignment is very, very useful for concentric circles. So if I do, if I select all of my concentric circles there and I align them horizontally in the centre 
and then vertically in the centre, we now have perfectly aligned concentric circles. So very useful for doing circles that way. Alignment is also incredibly... Uh, sorry? Sure. Uh, so you can lock elements. Good question. You can lock elements with Inscribus. So what you have to do first is select the elements that you would like to lock. And then on your properties window, you'll see a key, uh, like a lock in a key. And if you lock that in position, then unlock, say, the one in the middle. You can move that around and offset it and you can't actually move the other ones. So you can lock elements in position on the page like that. Was that what you were looking for? Yeah. Yep, from that question. So alignment's also very useful for laying out grids. And you can see here the classic, you know, 16 elements that need to be laid out. And what we need to do here is a couple of things. We first of all need to align these horizontally. So what I want to do here is make sure that they're in alignment horizontally. And then what I'm going to do is group them so that I have one row grouped. I'm then going to do the same for the second row. and I'm going to group that row. I'm going to do the same for the third row. I'm going to group that row. I'm going to do the same for the bottom row. Oops, wrong alignment. I'm going to group those. And because now I have one, two, three, four groups, I can now treat these as four elements. And what I'm going to do here is align them all to the left. But you can see there that it's not perfect. It's not a perfect grid. And the reason that it's not a perfect grid is that we don't have what we call even distribution in between each of the elements. So these elements are not equidistant, they're not evenly spaced. So even though I've got alignment, my elements are not well distributed. Can anyone guess what we're going to cover next? <laughs> Boom. So closely related to alignment is distribution. So distribution is very, very similar to alignment. We have a very similar set of uh, similar looking set of tools. And so alignment and distribution are used together to create evenly spaced grids. So what distribution allows us to do is to ensure that the spacing of these elements is uh, equidistant. So I'm running out of real estate here. Uh, one hot tip I have if you're going to use Scribus, <laughs> try it either on a very large monitor or on a dual monitor setup. <laughs> Um, and that way you can have one screen for your document and one screen for your tools. So I'm going to ungroup that. And what I'm doing here, I'm now going to distribute these elements and I'm going to distribute them horizontally, equidistantly. And so what this will do is automatically make that spacing in between the elements 
are all even. I'm going to do the same thing for that row and the same thing for that row and the same thing for that row. And now they're all spaced equally. Aha! I hear someone cry. <laughs> but Kathy, you've only spaced them horizontally. You're an excellent audience. I shall have to bring chocolate more often. Yes, you're very right. I've only spaced them horizontally. So what I now need to do is make sure that each of my rows is now a group. And then what I'm going to do is space them all vertically. So I've now spaced each of the elements in a row horizontally. And now I'm going to space the rows vertically. Uh, that was subtle, but it did change. I promise. So that's the easiest way to use distribute. What I can also do is use a specific uh, distance. So I might want 5 mil between each of those elements. And... Just making sure I've got the right tool tip. What I'm going to do here using this tool, the one in the bottom right hand corner, is make sure that the distance between each of those elements is five millimetres. Boom. So no mucking around with rulers, no having to set up guides. I've just got five mil of space. And that makes it a lot, lot easier. Does that all make reasonable sense? I, I'm seeing a few nods, I'm seeing a few... It's Friday and I'm a bit tired, <laughs> which is completely fine as well. Is anyone feeling up for alignment and distribution challenge? All right, if, if anyone cries, I'll, I'll move on. Um, I do have an alignment and distribution challenge for you. If you go into your uh, tutorial files, you'll have exercise two, distribution. <laughs> yeah, font substitution. So, this is a quasi-fictional character. For anyone who's a lover of science fiction. Uh, the fonts that this was made with are actually all in your tutorial files if you, if you want to install the fonts. So Billy Gibson, our, our quasi-fictional character, has decided to get some business cards printed. And so what we're going to do is align these uh, in a grid on the page so they can be sent for printing. That's right. I'll, I'll step everyone through it. So the first thing that we're going to do is make sure that every row aligns up to the top. So now I have four rows and they're all horizontally aligned. But what I need to do now is make sure that all of my columns align as well. So I've just selected all the elements in the column and I'm left aligning them. So this is good. It's not brilliant, but it's good. All of my rows are in the same horizontal line. 
all of my columns are in the same vertical line, but they're not distributed. So now what I'm going to do is make sure these are, are distributed equally horizontally. And now what I'm going to do is group all of my rows together so that I can distribute them, distribute them vertically. can see there that oh come on So what I'm going to do now that all my rows are grouped is distribute them vertically. And now what I'm going to do is group that all together and pop that neatly on the page for printing. Everyone following along okay? Yep. Excellent. I'll give everyone a, a couple of minutes on that one. This one isn't particularly easy, so if you're coping okay with this one, you're doing really well. So this is exactly how, you know, we lay out stickers or business cards or you know, multiple documents for printing. All right. I'll give everyone a, a couple of minutes there and I'll just grab a drink. I doubt that. <laughs> It's the, the flip of what I did, but oh, it's, okay. still, it's still completely valid. So instead of uh, doing rows first, then aligning the columns, mm -hmm. you've gone columns first and align the rows, and that's equally valid as well, because right. that all lines up perfectly. I'm a sideways person. <laughs> no. Fist bump. Sorry? Fist bump. Because cool. you've done a brilliant job. <laughs> Because that's a socially acceptable thing to do. <laughs> sorry, I, <laughs> I, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so everyone's okay with the uh, the layout so far. We're ready to move on. Um, show of hands, ready to move on. Excellent. All right. Um, if you want to go into more advanced distribution functions, I won't be opening that for a while. 
If you want to go into more advanced distribution functions, you can distribute elements uh, with reference to the margin, with reference to the entire page as well. So you can distribute uh, elements between the margins on the page or across the entire page as well. That's a really handy trick, but I won't cover it here. We'll cover that. Cover distribution. Ha ha, onto layout elements. We're skipping through, that's fantastic. We've got about 40 minutes left. So, layout elements are at the heart of Scribus. And these are basically the bread and butter of your, your toolkit within Scribus. So we've already seen the arrow and used that a fair bit. But what I'd also like to show you is... <coughs> ..the text box. So the text box is used for drawing, funnily enough, <laughs> as it says on the lid, text boxes. Exactly. And so, in order to place text on the page, we have to have it in a text box. So it's the only way to put text on a page. We also have an image box. So with an image box, we draw you know, an approximate box where we want the image, but it's treated as a placeholder. We then need to go and get the image and drop it in the box. I'll show you how that's done. So you right click on the placeholder and it brings up this menu, the flyout menu, and we get the image. Now in your tutorial files, hands up who likes cyberpunk, hands up who likes butterflies. Hands up who likes neither. Oh, oh, sorry, you guys won't be having a lot of fun. Uh, so you can choose from either butterflies or cyberpunk images. I'm more of a cyberpunk girl. And we grab a typewriter. But what's happened here is that the image is a little bit too big for the image box. So I can do a couple of things here with this. I can choose whether to adjust the image to the frame. So this will try and keep it in proportion and put it in the frame. Or I can adjust the frame to the image and it will make the frame smaller. I can also do what's called free scaling. And this is used quite often for layout effects. So if I bring up my properties window again from Windows Properties, I'll just put a line and distribute to sleep. What I can do here with under the image uh, dialog, by default free scaling is not enabled because what Scribus wants to do is keep your image in proportion. Uh, with free scaling, we then tell Scribus what position in that frame we want the image to have and how big percentage wise we want that image to be. So if your X scale and Y scale are the same percentage, your image is going to retain its proportion. So I'm just going to make this one a lot larger. But that's not where I want the image to be inside the frame. I want to move that image up in the frame and a little bit to the left. And the way I do that is by manipulating the Y position and the X position. Now, if your preferences are set correctly, you'll have millimetres here instead of points. So does everybody see millimetres here instead of points? Excellent, that means your preferences are set correctly. I can't convert millimetres to points in my head, so I'm going to have a guess here. Ah, wrong way. If you want to move the image down, positive number, if you want to move the image up, negative number. I want that a bit bigger. Still a bit bigger. And I want to move that a little bit to the left. So to move it to the left, I use a negative number. 
and I'm reasonably happy with that. So what this means is that my image still has its proportions and I've moved it around in its frame. Does that sound reasonably straightforward? I'm, I'm getting a lot of blank looks. Everyone? Uh, someone? Can we ask me all the numbers that you drive around? Sorry? If you put a mouse wheel over the number you drive around. Uh, Is there a position? Like that? No, no. If, you, if you're clicking on the image and in the properties of the mm -hmm. My mouse at home doesn't have a mouse wheel. Thank you. That's fantastic. Oh, that's so cool. Thank you. I need to get a mouse with a mouse wheel. Uh, so that's our image box. That will work for raster images. Is everyone here familiar with the concept of raster versus vector images? Pretty comfortable. Anyone not familiar with raster versus vector images? No, I, I won't cover it, then I'll skip that. In order to import a vector image, it's slightly different. We go to File and we import Get Vector File. And because I have actually done some preparation for this talk, if you're on Team Cyberpunk, you'll have some vector files. And if you're on Team Butterfly, you have some vector files as well. So grab, some vector file, or grab a vector file from your tutorial files. I'm going to go with classic typewriter. And you'll find that you're asked to place that. I'm just going to make that a little bit smaller by dragging it down. And the great thing about vector files in Scribus is that you can do all sorts of things with the colours because they're vector files. So if I go to colours, I can do things like make that magenta. Make it black or blue. Um, what I'm trying to do is just get working for me. Apologies. So usually with a vector file you can recolor it that way. Uh, what I can also do is reduce the opacity. What I can also do is reduce the opacity and so that you get, you know, sort of ghosting effects like that. So that's vector files. I won't cover render frames today, but what I do need to let you know is that Scribus can render other documents like LaTeX or GNU plot. So if you use LaTeX, um, which I know uh, particularly in maths and science people do documentation in LaTeX, you'll be able to render LaTeX uh, in Scribus as well. So you basically draw a frame uh, and drop the, uh, drop the LaTeX into the frame. I won't cover tables today. Tables are basically uh, multiple text boxes. But I will cover shapes because they're incredibly useful. So Scribus gives you lots of default shapes to work with. And one of the things that I always do on a document is put in a background shape like that. And the reason that we do that is because by default Scribus lays your page out as if it were white. But often what you find is that you've got elements hanging off the page or elements that um, may not be uh, overlapping properly. So by creating a white background, 
and helps to prevent that. I'm going to move that to the back. I can also add other shapes. There's quite a few that Scribus gives me. One of my favourites here is the concentric circles. And then using properties, I can make that all sorts of colours. One of the things I will cover here, uh, in colours in your properties dialogue, you have two ways of adding colour. So if anyone's used Inkscape before, and I think somebody here has used Inkscape, you'll be used to using the terms fill and stroke. So painting inside the shape and painting a boundary around the shape. In Scribus, that's called line. So stroke is called line and fill is the same. So I'm going to take the line off that and make that a little bit darker. So they're the two types of... Uh, or the two ways in which you can manipulate colour. If you do want to put a line on a shape, you choose the line colour. And you can see here I've got blue as the line colour there. And then you can manipulate the line, uh, the line that's used. So I'm going to increase the line width there. And make that absurdly large. I can also choose what line my shape has. For example, you can get all sorts of lovely effects there for varying values of lovely. That's pretty cool. Might leave that there. But basically, your shapes are another key layout tool within Scribus. of other tools that you have for layout. You can have polygons with multiple sides. So if anyone loves polygons, you can rotate them, you can do all sorts of things. Let's have a hexagon because they're lovely. And then you basically just draw that polygon, like so. <coughs> so very similar to using Inkscape or any other sort of uh, layout package. And I should fill that with magenta. The other tools that Scribus gives you are very similar to Inkscape uh, or to Adobe Illustrator and those tools. You can include straight lines. So I draw a line anywhere along the page. Now to snap that line to a 45 degree angle, hold down the control key while you're drawing the line and the line will snap to a 45 to 45, some multiple of 15 degrees. <laughs> I can also do Bezier curves and they work very much the same way as Bezier curves do in Inkscape. Basically you take two points and have some handles and, uh oh, um, I think I crashed there, never mind. But basically you can draw Bezier curves. I will have to restart. You also have a freehand text tool. The freehand text, sorry, a freehand uh, line tool. 
Some of you might work with a graphics tablet, like a Wacom graphics tablet. It's very hard to get the precision control with the freehand tool there. And if you do have a graphics tablet, um, I would recommend using, um, using the freehand tool with the graphics tablet. Everyone following along okay? So. Good question. From memory, without my muscle memory here, I'm fairly sure it's the control key. Okay. Um, could you check that for me? Because I know you're on. Um, control key. And command key on Mac. Thank you very much. That's a really good question. Thank you. Sorry, I'm um, sweating up here. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give the Coke another minute and then see if I can open it without embarrassing myself further. Um, so we've covered a lot of the properties dialogue already, um, but basically the properties dialogue is the way that you uh, manipulate elements uh, within Scribus. Different elements, different layout elements will have different properties that you can manipulate there. Uh, so for example, uh, if you're using a vector image, you won't be able to do, um, you know, you won't have uh, the image properties available to you. So what we're going to do now, uh, we've covered raster images. In your tutorial files, we have a part three layout document for you to have a look at. And it looks like on substitution, that uh, looks a little bit like this. So what I'm hoping that you'll be able to do with this file is have a look at the different types of elements. So for example here, what we have is an image box and so we have image pieces available to us in the properties dialog. So feel free to have a go at freescaling that. You know, I might do something wild and crazy because totally wild and crazy me. And I might bump that up 100 mil and leave that like that. This is a vector image that's been imported. And I might decide that I want to make that a lovely magenta colour because that looks awesome, doesn't it? And I might decide that I want to change the colour of that. Why does anyone let me near a computer? And you can see here that now that I've changed the colour of the rows, that's come out. So I might want to pop that over there. Uh, and this is a freehand line that's been drawn. And so I might want to change the type of line and I might also want to change the colour of that line as well. I might also want to change the colour of that line as well. So this document's intended to give you a bit of a feel for the types of layout elements that you can have on a page and the types of properties that you can manipulate as well. Does that all seem fairly straightforward? Any questions? Does anyone need more chocolate or Tim Tams? No? I'll give everyone a couple of minutes on that and then I'm going to go to levels uh, and I'll walk everyone through using levels. I think I've got about 20 minutes left in the session, is that correct?
20 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> not, not intentional. <sighs> These are not the droids you're looking for. This is not the HDMI you're looking for. <sighs> Percussive maintenance. All right. So we're going to go into levels because they're incredibly important. Uh, and if, along with all of the other uh, concepts that you've learned today, many of these concepts are also present in other graphics programs, like GIMP or Inkscape, or heaven forbid, Quark. So levels are essentially, is anyone here as old as me and old enough to remember acetate sheeting that you used to get on overhead projectors? Yeah, OK. So I want you to think of a level as an acetate sheet. It's clear until you give it an opaque background, but it can be layered on top of each other. And if it has transparency, you can see through to the other layers on the bottom. But the order matters. And so in Scribus, you can raise a layer straight to the top. With raise to top, it goes straight to the top of that pile. You can put it right down the bottom and lower it to the bottom, or you can raise it one level at a time. And the way that we do that is in <laughs> Kel Surprise, our properties dialog box. So with level, uh, on the left there, you go the top left in the level, will take you up one level. Where it's got the up arrow with the line, that takes you straight up to the top. And conversely, at the bottom, the bottom arrow with the line will pop it straight down to the bottom of the pile of sheets. And the down arrow will take it down one level. So guess what? We have an exercise on levels. Surprise! Okay. So what we're going to do here is identify where in the order, we're going to use the same document we have, where in the level order each element is. And there's a really useful way to find that out, and that's with our outline. So if I go to Windows, Outline, and everyone can see the outline. we can now see all the elements on the page. So outline is particularly useful. Let's say that you're doing a layout and somehow you've got elements <laughs> that have gone underneath everything else and you can't get to them. Outline will allow you to select those elements. So here we have the text element. That should be showing a layer. 86, we have a polyline, some more text, we have a circle there, and what I'm going to do now is demonstrate how we basically lower them or raise them. So what I'm going to do is actually lower that circle, and you can see here as I'm doing that, I'll raise it back up again. In outline, my outline view gives me the cascade order of those elements. And of course, it means we can do funky stuff like, I make that a bit larger. I may only want up to there. And so what I can do is lower that down and hide it behind the image. One of the things we always have to look for or is a common problem when we're doing layout for press or layout to go to print is when you have text like this that somehow has accidentally gone missing. So that's often a common error when we're proofing things. Does that all seem straightforward so far? Everyone okay with levels? Excellent, I'll move on. 
And I do have to say a big thank you. I know that it's Friday, end of LCA. It's been a big week and um, I, I really do appreciate you, you coming to do a, a tutorial on layout design. Okay, so now we're going to do some work with text. Um, does anyone here do large documents with large pieces of text? I know, Alec, you probably do. Or anyone do annual reports or anything that has long pieces of text, not just posters or business cards? Okay, one person. So, basically, and remember when I got people to show text chain earlier in preferences? This is why. In Scribus, what we do to handle text, large slabs of text, with text boxes, if you have text boxes on multiple pages, what we can do with text chaining is link them together. So when you have some copy from somebody who's written you an article or a story, you might have asked for, say, 800 words, and they come back with 1,200, and you need to fit it on the page somehow. So by linking text boxes, you can make sure that the text overflows from one box to another box in a very logical way, and that's called text chaining, and we use it a lot. So the linking tool... Uh, here is the linking tool for text, to link the text box, and here is the unlink tool. And surprise... Exercise, no, I don't like surprise exercise. What I'm going to do here is show how to link text in two text boxes. So I'm going to select my first text box, link text frame, and I just click on the second box. And because we turned on text chaining, show text chaining our preferences, can everyone see over here where we have the line, where we have an arrow going from one text box to another? That's showing us that that is chaining the text. Text will overflow from one box to another. Now what I'm going to do is get some text. And remember how we got an image and put an image into an image frame? If you have writers that are creating copy for you, you can grab copy, you can type into the text box, but that's boring. And I prepared some text earlier. So we're going to get some text. And if you like butterflies, I've given you thematic text. And if you like cyberpunk, I've given you some thematic text there. What do we reckon, Gibson Ipsum or Web 2.0 Ipsum? Let's go with Web 2.0. And so we've imported our text into the text box. Ooh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and you can see that it's gone into the, the text box correctly. One of the things to keep an eye out for is this text overflow marker. So what this is telling us is that the text has overflowed the, the text box. I have a couple of options there. I can reduce the size of the text uh, or I can cut some of the text out. In the interest of time, I'm just going to cut some text out. How do you get to go on to the next page? Okay. So basically what I would need to do is insert a page uh, and insert a page at the end. So now I have another page. And then what I'm going to do is create a text box. And then with my text linking tool, what I'm going to do is link. Oh, already linked. Use my text link tool and it will link straight through. So this is basically how we set up multi-page documents. We link the text straight through. Of course, you might have, say, a page of advertorial or advertising, and you just don't link the text through to that page. So you oh, if, if there's a one in between, you would skip that and keep going down to the page you want to do. Exactly right. Story continues. Exactly. Yeah. So that's how we do text linking. 
And I know we've only got about 12 minutes left, but I do really want to quickly cover styles in Scribus because working with text and styles is really, really important. So if I go to text and style settings, uh, in the document, in the part four linking text document, I've created some, uh, ex some styles for you. I won't cover the difference between paragraph and character styles here because we, we only have a little bit of time. But basically, most of the styles that you create in Scribus will be paragraph styles and they'll be applied to the entire paragraph. And the way that we, the way that we apply a style is to place the cursor within the paragraph and choose the paragraph style. Ooh. <laughs> Sorry, not as cool as a Linux kernel, but... Um, and the way that we edit styles is under edit styles. And so once I have styled my text, I can then edit the style and any text that has that style will pick up the new style, just like in Microsoft Word. So I'm going to edit that style. And I'm going to make the text green, like so. And any text that has that style will pick up the new style. Uh, if I was doing a longer version of this tutorial, I'd do a lot more in depth about styles and how styles can be based on each other. So does anyone in here work with cascading style sheets at all in the web space? So Scriber styles use a form of cascade. You can have a base style and then other styles based off that style and if you change the base style, the additional bits cascade down to any children's styles that have been created. But we don't have time to cover that. So is it on any new paragraph you select or is it on all the existing ones in your document so far as well? Uh, so by default, the text in your document will have a style called default paragraph style. So if I edit the default paragraph style, and let's make that a bit smaller, then everything that has that default style will change. But if the text has been already had another style applied and you change that style... Those paragraphs of that style will all change. Yes. Within, even though they've already been in there. So you think, yep. oh, that's all right, then you change one of there, you go, oh, they, they ones change too. Exactly. And that's why it's quite dangerous once you've laid out a page and you go and change styles, it can have unintended consequences. <laughs> so what we like to do as um, designers is set up the styles first and Think make... It through first. Exactly. Yeah, bit of planning, which, as you can see, is not my forte today. So that's a little bit about styles and manipulating text. I strongly recommend having a go at doing a lot of text in Scribus because it's one of the things that we use a significant amount of. Do you have some hints about what makes it look good and what doesn't? For example, ten different fonts in the same mm -hmm. document? Maybe not, um, unless you have a reason for it, rather yeah. than just trying all the fonts. The only way I've seen 10 different documents used in a, in a document is when the document is how not to use fonts in a document. Oh, like <laughs> um, there's a couple of design principles, and I, I should have been clear at the start, I didn't want to go into design principles today. This is very much a um, how, to how to use the tool. Um, so there are a couple of design principles, good white space, um, fonts often have very good pairings. So is anyone here a wine and, or cheese connoisseur? Yep. You know how you get some wines and you have some cheeses that go together very, very well? Often some heading fonts and some body copy fonts go together very, very well, like good wine and cheese. So sometimes you have to do a bit of picking and choosing to figure out which you know, two fonts go together nicely. Uh, we have some recommendations around colour and colour schemes that work very well together. Um, so if colour is a language and colour is a communication tool, you know, I don't have time to talk about it today, but you know, if you're doing a, you know, a funeral brochure for someone in memoriam, you're probably not wanting bright colours, you're probably wanting something subtle. So colour is a communication tool. Um, we also think about 
uh, how much text should be on the page, what's readable, is it too crowded, that sort of thing. So looking for readability, accessibility, wanting people to absorb the information from the page. So I have children and they write, they write their, their text in yellow, pencil mm -hmm. on white paper, and yep. they go, us adults can't read that. <laughs> and that's necessity for anything yep. the same as you don't do yellow if, if, ex if accessibility is something that um, is a particular, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Concern, thank you. One of the ways that uh, Scribus helps with this, I'll just turn off some of my tools. If you go view and preview mode, what Scribus will do is take off all the like the boxy layout, so this will get you as close as it possibly can to what you're going to get out of the printer. And then what you can do in the bottom right hand corner, you can preview what your document will look like with colour blindness. Ooh. Now, this is something I haven't seen in a lot of other uh, programs. So I can simulate uh, red colour blindness. So that's still pretty good contrast. Can simulate green colour blindness. Still not bad. Uh, blue and full colour blindness. So this takes out all colour and renders it entirely in grayscale. And the contrast there still isn't too bad. So it's a very good way if you have an audience with colour blindness. Or you end up printing in black and white a colour, what's done in, in colour. Yep. White. Exactly. So if you Exactly, if you're printing grayscale, you turn on full colour blindness and you can see what you're going to get. So, very useful accessibility tool. What an excellent segue. <laughs> 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 so, working with colours, and I'm going to try and cover this in five minutes before morning tea because I, I don't want to be standing between you and morning tea. Um, so, when you open a Scribus document, it looks like there aren't very many colours included. Uh, that's not correct. Scribus has about 200 colour palettes that you can import. Um, unfortunately, I don't know where to find them on a Mac. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but on a Linux system, they're in user share Scribus swatches. And a lot of those swatches will match colour schemes that are often used in scientific computing. So if anyone here uses Python and some of the, or what's the other one, the map one that's used in mapping colour, uh, colour brew? Yeah, it will have colour brew palettes as well. So you can bring those colour brew palettes in and it will um, drop them in uh, quite well. Um, for anyone who's really interested in Scribus and colours, Scribus can import colours from a GPL or XML file. Um, I won't have time to cover that today, but you can grow your own palettes. One thing I do want to cover is that if you're... I won't go into the theory behind this, but if you're doing documents for print, your files must be in CMYK. Your colours must be in CMYK format. RGB is a colour model or a way that monitors show us colour, but if you're printing documents, the printer models that colour in a different way. And so in your colour palette, in your colour palette, you'll have an indicator here to show whether, oh, come on, to, I can't compute it today, I apologise. You see how you have an icon there? It shows me that it's CMYK because it has four colours. If I wanted to change that colour into an RGB colour, I simply edit that colour and I have the RGB icon instead. So I'm going to change that back to CMYK. I won't have time to go through colours today. There is a tutorial uh, in your tutorial pack and uh, there are slides there for colour. But what I do quickly want to cover off today
is how to export your document. So you spent a lot of time laying out this document and now you want to export it to PDF. Does anyone here write unit tests or tests for code? A couple of people. <laughs> Good point. Preflight verifier is like unit tests for documents. And so your preflight verifier uh, will check that your document is okay to be exported. And so what I'm going to do here is export this document to PDF and my pre-flight verifier is set to PostScript, but I want it to check against PDF, and it's all fine. And then I export it to PDF. And that should generate. It's probably already done it. And if I go back into colour, here I have a print-ready PDF because all those colours are CMYK and I can send this straight to the printer. One, word, one final word of minute, well, one final piece because I've only got about 30 seconds left is that when you're outputting a file to PDF, you have a key trade-off. Your key trade-off is between quality and file size. If you're taking something to the printer, to Officeworks or to a print, pre-print, to a pre-press store, you want as high a quality as possible. We measure quality in documents in DPI or dots per inch, and it's the resolution of the document on the paper or on the canvas. You need about 300 DPI for going to print, and if you're going to the web, you need about 72 DPI, and the file sizes for those are vastly different, as you can imagine. I know, sure. Amy's just touched on a topic called bleeds, and what, um, I won't cover that today, but if somebody, anyone here is looking at using this for printing, there's a whole heap of other things that I can talk you through, like registration marks and bleeds. Unfortunately, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, so I do, again, want to thank you for your patience and for sticking through uh, uh, some technical areas here. I really do appreciate your patience, and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, presenting here this year at uh, Linux ConfAU. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a small token of our appreciation from the conference. And thank you for volunteering. Thank, thank you. you very much.